Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Enlightening Conversations with the YWCA of Hanover. My name is Lisa Smith, and I'll be your host this evening. And our topic this evening is homosexuality and the church. A very broad topic. I'm sure you can relate to that. And um, it's gonna, we're going to try to touch on various aspects of human sexuality and what the church has to say about it in, um, in various ways through biblical passages and through regular church teachings. We have two individuals here this evening who I think are gonna be able to enlighten us in a variety of ways. The first person I'd like to introduce, um, and I will introduce both of them and then give each of them a chance to speak. Um, uh, first person, if you look to the bottom of your screen is Mary Almy. Mary is the treasurer for the Rainbow Rose Center, which is York County's um, Pride Center. I didn't know exactly how to say that, Mary, because the center, the physical center, I know you said has closed because of COVID, but the organization, um, the Rainbow Rose Center is very much alive and, and well, um, just operating in virtual space because of COVID until you find a new um, physical space to operate in. Mary is a lifelong Presbyterian and is married to a Presbyterian pastor. She is a church elder and for 14 years she worked as a missionary in Africa. So she's very well versed in um, church issues and theology. Although she did say that the term church has some mixed connotations for her. So she identifies more as a follower of Christ and a trans woman of faith rather than a specifically a church person. I can understand that, Mary, because I, I have the same kind of feelings. So, um, so she's going to speak to us on, on her perspective. And then up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen is Mark Hoffman. Mark is a pastor and professor of biblical studies at the United Lutheran Seminary. That seminary is located in both Gettysburg and Philadelphia. Prior to COVID, he was running back and forth on Route 30 all the time. But again, now due to COVID, uh, he has that virtual connection as well. Mark had 14 years of parish experience in both Minnesota and North Dakota before starting to teach at the seminary in 2002. His main areas of interest within biblical studies are the Gospel of Mark, the Greek language, the parables of Jesus, the Old Testament within the New Testament, and performance aspects of presenting the biblical text. His wife is Kathy Huffman, who's the current pastor at St. Matthew Luther Church in Hanover. And Mark mentioned that he is here this evening, not so much as an expert on LGBTQ issues, but as an expert in scriptural issues. So he can give us the opinions from that perspective. So we'll have... Um, he, he's here more as an ally uh, than as a an, an, uh, person who's experienced in that community um, at large. So I'm going to leave it up to you, Mark and Mary, which one of you would like to speak first? I'd like to just get a little couple of uh, minutes background from you as to how you see this issue. If someone said to you, well, what is the church's position or how do you feel about um, how the church views homosexuality, what would you respond? I'm, I'm going to defer to Mary. <laughs> okay, Mary, there you go. And I was going to defer to you, but that's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's an easy question to answer, first of all. Um, when I say I have a interesting connection to the church and the church has different connotations to me. Um, <clears throat> I've been a lifelong member of the church. I grew up in a church. My parents raised me in a church. Um, obviously, I married a Presbyterian minister. And at the same time, the church has been extremely hurtful to me, um, mm -hmm. telling me that I was I did not exist. And when I started my transitioning, um, the church that Betsy and I were at and the church that Betsy was a pastor at 
turned against us and because she stood with me, they threw her out as the minister. And in that process, even some of the parishioners threw stones at me, literally in the parking lot of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been told not to come into churches. Um, I have a friend whose mother passed away and she wanted to attend the funeral and the church pastors and elders barred the door. They let the mother in for the funeral and the rest of the family. But because she was a trans woman, they would not let her in. Um, and then at the same time, I have had churches stand up for me and welcome me and utilize my gifts and love me like Christ has called us to love. And I think that's what we need to focus on in all of these discussions is there can be no, no sense for me, there can be no sense of anything except the Christ calls us to love. I mean, that, that's what the scripture is about. That, that, that was the, that's what the cross is about. Um, so if you don't do that, then you are not following what Christ calls. And you're making God into your own image. And that is heresy at the best. So I, I think that's how I respond to those kind of questions of what do I think the church says? I say, I'm more concerned about what God says and what mm -hmm. Christ has says. And that um, is that God loves us. And I can tell a story sometime if we have time tonight about having a vision about how God loves me when I first started to transition. Okay, hopefully we do have time for that. Um, Mark, let's, let's go to you. How would you address that question? Well, first of all, as Mary's already hinted at here, uh, the church has no one, the church has no one answer to this. Um, even within um, any single denomination, uh, Mary's Presbyterian, my Lutheran, there's varieties of Lutherans, varieties of Presbyterians that are just all over the map in terms of uh, their approaches and their understandings of this issue. And so, uh, first of all, when we're talking here this evening, it's we can't really say what does the church say. Um, what we're really talking about here is, is trying to get a sense of um, what do we understand? Uh, how does God continue to speak to us today? And how are we experiencing uh, these kind of issues in our lives today? So that's that's a, a certainly a, a more ambiguous way that we can't just say, well, the church says, and then everybody has right. to agree with that. So a lot of it does come down to the matter of uh, biblical interpretation. Um, and uh, as Mary has hinted at, one of the one of the ways that we can approach this whole issue is, is just saying, well, what is the key principles? What are the, the main things that we want to highlight? And Mary's already highlighted the love of God. And, and if you start from that, you're going to read the Bible in one way, then uh, as compared to somebody who's approaching it and saying, well, what is this? what's the law? What uh, simply you know, I'm looking for permissions and not permissions. Um, in my understanding of how we read and relate to the Bible, um, it was a book that was written over the course of, of a couple thousand years almost. And it represents a world and a culture that's 2,000 to 3,000 plus years removed from ours. Um, how do we make that transition from that ancient right. time to now? Um, do we just say it goes straight over, you read it and the Bible says it and I believe it? Or do we have some sense of um, what is God doing in our lives now? So I, I've got more ways I can talk about that, but that would be my initial response to you, Lisa. Right, right. And, and I think you both, the, the two of you point out um, a, a really key issue that we all face is when you're trying to define church, are you talking about a building? Are you talking about an organization or you or are you talking about a person? And the the problem is for most of us, church really, when you're looking at it as a um, as a guiding force, you're talking about God and everybody has a different connection there, a different representation, a different understanding. Um, Mary, you had mentioned about having kind of a, a negative feeling with the word church, and, and I uh, have sometimes had that same feeling, I think, because to me, churches are organizations, bureaucracies, um, and um, therefore they're run by, 
by mankind, by people. And as we all know, even the best bureaucracies, the best organizations, the best governments, we can screw up. You know, we can really mess things up. So, you know, um, I think as Mark says, we need to look beyond that and look to um, what God has said. And the only thing we have from that, other than what we know in our hearts and our minds, is what is is presented within uh, Bible passages. So, um, you know, for for just for clarification's sake, maybe we need to define a couple things this evening, and we might use the words interchangeably. But we're really looking at what does the Bible say, you know, in in this situation. So, because uh, it's the only thing that we know for certain. Because um, if you say, what does the church say? It could be, well, this pastor said this, but this one over here from the same denomination said something completely different. So, you know, it could, it could be that way. So also when we talk about, we may just use the broad term homosexuality, but we're talking about the whole length and breadth of human sexuality. So it could be, lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, gender questioning, intersectionality, everything that's on the rainbow flag plus. So because there's all nuances of how people feel about their sexuality. So we don't want to miss anybody in that. So we'll just take the understanding from the beginning that we're embracing it all. Um, one of the things that's always... Um, I don't want to say infuriated, but it's irked me, um, some kinds infuriated, depending on the day, um, is people who will take scriptural passages or scriptural stories and twist them to um, get a basis for their hatred for other people. Are there particular passages that, um, that either one of you have found that trip trip people up that make them feel that they have cause or they have reason to be discriminatory against people whose sexual orientation may be different than theirs? I can start here with Bible stuff if we want to go there. Um, there are a number of passages, people sometimes call them clobber passages, um, because the, they, they clobber you over the head with they them. They clobber you over the head with them. Um, there's a number of passages. Um, it starts in uh, Genesis, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, where the angelic visitors, and there's, uh, it, it seems that the people of Sodom want to sexually know these uh, angelic uh, visitors this way. Uh, Leviticus, uh, there's a couple passages uh, specifically refer to homosexual, male homosexual acts. Um, there's a couple things um, that you could um, point to in the New Testament, uh, Romans uh, 1, uh, 26 and following, Paul talks about uh, unnatural uh, relations, especially in, in relationship to men with each other. Um, and there's another passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and uh, 1 Timothy 1, 8. Now, the thing is, I would say those are all pretty clear in terms of um, um, what they're against. And we should note then a couple of things. For one, there is no idea of sexual identity or gender orientation or any of those things. They are talking simply about uh, sexual behavior. And they are only actually ever talk about um, male sexual behavior is really that um, is at issue here. Um, so you've got that. And then you add in the layer of uh, culture. Um, I mean, what was going on 2,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago um, represents a whole different sort of cultural understanding that you really can't translate to today. What I find particularly interesting is that if you go through all of the teachings of Jesus, he says about this matter, he says nothing. There is nothing in the teachings of Jesus that he ever is concerned about this at all. And I, so if I can pull out maybe four or five verses out of the whole Bible, I, to me, that's an indication that it's, it's not one of the key things that we should be focusing on that should become a creed, uh, key discrimination factor 
uh, among Christians that, I mean, there's always so much more stuff about what people do with their wealth and so on like that. Right. And that's where Jesus spends his time. He's not interested in gender identity and sexual um, um, homosexual acts and stuff like that. He doesn't ever mention it. Um, so yes, there are some of these clobber passages, but I would say there's ways that we would want to um, understand those within their context. And then beyond that, go to start talking about where do we see the, the larger principles coming to play. And I can say more about that later, but I'd like to let Mary talk. And I think, I think Lisa, you mentioned something when you were talking um, about the interpretation of the scripture. Mm -hmm. And these, these passages that are used as clubs against the LGBTQ community, community Again, I go back to being that they are being used to support and, and, and allow for those who have already set up an attitude to find proof of that mm -hmm. somewhere else. So, for example, first of all, homosexual, homosexuality, the word homosexual was not in the original scriptures. It was mm -hmm. added in after World War II. So, I mean, it was not even close to being new. Um, so when you look back at those passages, a lot of what they were talking about was men forcing young boys to have sex with them because mm -hmm. that was how it was done. Um, the men um, forcing sex upon other men after war, after victory, to belittle the men and show that the power over them. Right. So it wasn't loving acts, but it was forced acts. And, that, right. and I, that, was, that was where. And I go back again, Jesus said nothing about these. It wasn't, if, if it was such an issue, I think Jesus would have blasted that as much as he blasted the wealthy who weren't supporting the, the poor. Um, but then you can go to passages, for example, like Psalm 139, you know, where God created me in my mother's womb and knew me in my mother's womb and created me in a wonderful thing. I was created as a wonderful person. Um, Galatians, there is either Jew nor, nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. So, I mean, in Christ, you know, you, you you can't, you can't, when you take scripture, you cannot take one or two verses out of that and then hold them as the all-inclusive, this is, this is what is meant by this. And the other thing that I always kind of, and it does make me angry, uh, is this, <laughs> that when, when they use these verses, especially the ones from Leviticus, Leviticus they ignore a whole lot of other rules and regulations that mm -hmm. were back in those days were used but we don't use them like wearing clothes of combined material right eating shellfish eating from the you know so there was a whole lot of things and then you come to the, to the new testament and you see where i believe it was paul i might be wrong but i believe it was paul who had the vision to go to the um Gentile and to eat and share what the Gentile was eating and, and not calling anything unfit that God called fit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in Acts 10, 28, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So I think scripture has a lot more of those passages than it does of the clobber passages. Right, right. But I think people I mean, want uh, justification they pull out those clobber passages sure yeah mark i'm sorry i think i cut you off there well i wanted to follow up exactly where mary ended up there what she was talking about in acts 10 it's the story of peter um who uh has this vision of the unclean animals and god mm -hmm. says it's un they're clean and he goes and he meets with this uh uh, a, a centurion, a Gentile centurion, a Roman soldier. And um, while he's, uh, Paul, uh, Peter is very confused about the situation. Um, and as he's preaching to them, the spirit comes upon them and uh, they all end up being baptized. And that for Peter was this sort of turning moment. And for me, actually, this is the, if, 
there isn't a verse that you can point to and say, this is all, um, you know, you can't point to a verse and say, this is all um, what God wants and something and like this. The key for me then is in Acts 15. So that was Acts 10, uh, that the story that Mary uh, mentioned there. And what happens after that is this uh, group of people who are Gentiles are uh, becoming Christians. And there so many Gentiles are becoming Christians that it's becoming uh, a question of how, what's, where does the Jewish come in? Jesus was Jewish, all the disciples were Jewish, they're still practicing kosher, they're still going to the temple. And in Acts 15, they have to call an assembly. And the question is, um, uh, can, a, can a Gentile become a Christian without first becoming a Jew? And the main issue there with that is uh, circumcision uh, for the males. Do the, does a Gentile male have to be circumcised, i.e. identify as a Jew, in order to become a Christian? Now, what happened is they got together, and among the Christians there, there was dispute, and some of them said they pointed to Scripture. They pulled out the Bible passages that say you must be circumcised to be part of this larger family of Abraham, and uh, others were bringing in other passages that talk about the inclusion of the Gentiles, and the main thing that came out of that was simply the experience of what the Holy Spirit was doing, that these people these Gentiles were becoming Christians. And ultimately, then the, the statement was, who are we to get in the Spirit's way? And if this is what God is now doing as right. this sort of new thing in the community, let's just embrace this and go with that. And so for me, in some sense, all the, the Christian history has for a long time been very negative against any um, non-heterosexual behavior and, and so on like that. Um, but for me, um, I look at a person and I say, um, do you love God? Do you proclaim the gospel? Do you see how God is active in your life? Do you understand the love of God? If so, praise the Lord. This is what the spirit is doing now. This is, this is something we should all be able to, uh, welcome and embrace. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I, I have to wonder, and I, I don't remember where I heard it, but at some point in my education and, and upbringing, it was um, mentioned that a lot of those references, because they reference only male sexual behavior, that a lot of those taboos against it were because at that time, you made the, the, the mention, Mark, of the culture in which this was written at that time it was critically important that this group of people continued to expand and grow and so the idea of a sexual act not potentially producing children was considered an abomination not the act not the potential love behind it if 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 it was not an act of power as you said mary but the potential waste of a, a possible pregnancy. Is that something that you came across in either, either of you in your understandings? Um, this does go back to, uh, there's a story in Genesis 38. Um, it's really, it was a story that was prohibited from being read in the synagogue because it was so embarrassing in a way. Ooh. Um, it's the story of uh, uh, Judah and his um, uh, sons here that uh, the one they married, uh, the eldest son married uh, Tamar. And when the eldest son died, according to uh, the custom, the sort of prescription at the time, uh, the next brother would marry the, the brother's wife in order to raise up children on behalf of the of the brother. This was that way of keeping the family name intact, of expanding the family and all those kind of things. Well, it turns out the one brother wasn't wanting to spoil his inheritance by expanding. And so he, he didn't do it. And then another one um, came and uh, he, he spilled his seed is what it says here, because right. he didn't want to make Tamar pregnant and he died. And then uh, 
uh, when uh, Judah says, well, you got to wait for my next younger son. And it would have been another 15 years before this little baby was ready. So Tamar took things into her own hand, uh, dressed up as a prostitute. And Judah, this very wonderful patriarch of uh, the Jewish uh, uh, family there, uh, he comes across this prostitute and has sex with her. And uh, when it turns out later that she's pregnant, he wants to, he's saying, oh, this, um, well, that tra Tamar's pregnant. He says, we need to stone her because she's committed some kind of adultery. And then she took as a sort of a token, his staff and his ring. And she says, well, here's the daddy. And then he's like, oh, well, <laughs> uh, she's more righteous than I. Um, yeah. So that, that whole sense here, um, of, uh, as you say there, that procreation and extending a family name, uh, that is partly behind it here. Um, but we also um, can again step back and talk about uh, the larger sense of how do we express and experience God's love? Um, right. That would be the larger issue. Right, right. Um, yeah, and I, I think that it there's so many issues wrapped up there that it's kind of hard to separate what it is that that um, that uh, the writer may have been addressing when they were explaining that particular um, passage, you know, or what they they were trying to convey, you know, when they wrote that particular um, piece. Are there particular passages that you like to pull from in um i don't, don't want to say defense but in defense of homosexuality in defense of the differences amongst people i mean other than the fact that god is love and you know you you can't love you can't not love what god has created um you know, and I know that's not a that's not a reference to any particular passage. It's just a concept. I, I had a, a good friend, and, and I can't remember what the passage was that that he referenced. That um, it felt that even though he had finally come to grips with his sexuality and and was able to um, accept the fact that that he was gay. He was not ready to tell the world, but he felt better about himself when he found a particular passage in the Bible because he knew that God had made him in his image. And he, he would repeat to me, God doesn't make junk, you know, and it was his, um, you know, modern day version of what that passage said to him. So are there particular passages that you like to pull from? to help people understand that they're looking at things incorrectly? I, I have a few. Um, Psalm 139 that I mentioned earlier, um, it's talking about being created and how God created me and knit me in my mother's womb and knew me um, and that I was, um, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And, and so, I mean, that to me, God doesn't create junk. God doesn't make mistakes. Right. Um, I was, um, God, God knew me. I mean, God, God is, it's, it's not like I could hide. I ever hid from God. I might've been able to hide who I was from family and friends. I might've been able to hide that from but i can never hide that from god um the story about the ethiopian eunuch um you're talking about truly a transgender person if you use the word transgender as somebody who crosses over the gender norms of the time and yes. um the eunuch was that and then you know the scripture passage saying that some were born eunuchs some were created eunuchs and it was all done for the glory of god um that's another passage for me. I think, though, for me, I, I just keep going back to this, is that, again, if, if you start to try to use scripture to prove who I am and, and, and prove my acceptance, 
I don't think it's much different than those who use the clobber passages. Ah, because because I think I, th I think what needs to be done is we need to look and see, and this is why I consider myself a follower of Christ, is what does Christ call us to be? You know, the, the passage, and uh, Mark might be able to help me remember where it comes from, but it's walk humbly with the Lord, love Maybe. justice. Um, those, are the, those are the qualities that Christ calls us to be. To be compassionate, to be servants of others, um, and I think this is a good time maybe to tell you my story, and I'll, I'll make it brief. Okay. No need; we have time. Okay. In, in, in Sudan, um, I, I worked in Sudan for fourteen years, and I traveled throughout Africa doing my mission work. Um, and in there faith beliefs, and they, they're, they believe very deeply in visions. Um, the Muslims who were being converted were being converted because of visions of God coming to them and talking to them. So vision is very much believed and accepted there, much more than it is in our culture. Um, and I was there one time, and my wife and I were sitting in the house, and we were having our quiet time and our devotional time. And it was a time when I was really struggling with who I was. I hated myself because I was believing everything that people within the church were telling me about who I was. And I was suicidal. Um, and I was sitting there and we had just had a scripture passage and we were meditating on it. And as I was meditating, I had an out of body experience. I was, in the room, I could look down and see myself sitting there, and I could see Betsy sitting across from me, and it was like I was sitting up in a balcony looking down. Mm -hmm. And as I watched, Betsy faded away, and where I was sitting, a chair developed, and it happened to be like my grandfather's chair, favorite chair that I used to love to call up in my grandfather's lap. But it was a big armchair, and this person, was in the chair. And I immediately knew within my heart that it was Jesus. I, mm -hmm. I just knew. And I was watching this. And as I was watching this, out of the side of the room where the door was, this woman came walking in and looked at Jesus and started to back up. And Jesus opened their arms and said, Mary, come here. And I watched this woman go to Jesus. Now, we need to know that the vision of the woman was the vision I have of myself. It was who I was. You also need to know that we had named me Mary to help me with some of the dysphoria. That was something Betsy called me so that people she could call me that and would help me. And so I saw myself walking to Jesus's arms. I literally felt Jesus's arms wrap around me and hold me and say, Mary, I love you. You are my child. And the next thing I knew was Betsy coming over to me and holding me and saying, why are you crying? because I was sitting in my chair bawling. And I explained that to her and she just had a chill. And to this day, that is where I, I am grounded in knowing that God loves me because God came to me and said, Mary, I love you. Now I know in our culture, visions, people look at me and laugh and say, you're crazy, that didn't happen. You know, how do you know that wasn't of the devil and all of this? And you know one thing, it wasn't of the devil because the sense of peace that came with that, mm -hmm. the sense of strength that came with that. Um, but so for me, it, it, it's, I love to read the scripture because scripture is something that teaches me, but it's something that I allow the spirit to show me the way through. So I tend not to go to certain passages and say, this is what it says and this is what it means. Mm -hmm. Because again, I just think that that's using that scripture to prove what I want it to be proven. 
I say, this is what this scripture is saying to me. And this is where I feel my relationship is with God. It's not with Lisa. It's not with Mark. Um, it, it's with God. And I'm a follower of Christ. And so I have no fears whatsoever of standing before God when my time comes and not and knowing that God's going to be there and Jesus is going to be there and reach his arms out again and wrap them around me and say, Mary, I love you. I mean, that's, that's how I look at these passages. What a blessing. What a blessing, Mary. Um, and no doubt he will be in that same chair. So. I, I, believe I believe it. Yeah, I believe it. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. That, that had to be that, 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 um, that took strength. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to add there before? Oh, yeah, Rosemary's thank you. popping in. Thank you. What a powerful story you just shared with us, Mary. And I think now would be a great opportunity to um, let let some of our what listeners, watchers, viewers um, weigh in on some of the things that we've been talking about here over the last half hour. Um, LaDonna Thomas, uh, taking us back a, a little bit ago to when we were talking about um, what Jesus would say and what is specifically in the Bible as it pertains to LGBTQ um, and, and, and Christ's word. Uh, LaDonna Thomas said, what's Jesus interested in? Let's put our energies there. So when you were speaking of that, I, I believe what LaDonna is commenting on is um, the actual words in the Bible uh, that Jesus would Sorry, I'm moving my camera. Uh, that Jesus would have to say on that topic. So I, I think that that goes back a few minutes ago when, when you were discussing that, but I'd like to just let everybody know that LaDonna had a comment there. Uh, Jody Schaefer has asked if a homosexual encounters someone who is clobbering them with verses from the Bible, how would you suggest they respond? Um, you want to hear? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to respond to that, and then maybe Mark can, but I have been, like I said, I had church members who knew me and were members of my congregation throw stones at me, so I'd say that's a pretty much a clobber passage. Um, yeah. I have had people, I've had people tell me that um, God is, hates me and used all those passages, and I will be the first one to admit I used to be a police officer, so I kind of have a background in, in some of this, but um, I, I'd be the first one to admit that my first instinct is to smack them upside their head. Um, but that's not how I have ever responded. I, I, I don't believe that's how Christ wants me to respond. Um, I respond the way Christ responded to his accusers. I try to. Um, I either, sometimes I've walked away, and other times, I just look at the person and say, you really don't know me, and you're going to use these passages to condemn me. And I think maybe let's get together and know each other a little bit first, and then maybe you might change your mind. Maybe not, and, but let's have this conversation. Um, and again, this comes from being in Sudan. Um, it was a fundament fundamental Islamic country, and I can't tell you how many times I sat down with fundament fundamentalist Muslims who were adamant that Americans were evil people and we broke bread and we shared tea and we had discussions openly and we became fast friends. Maybe not changed each other's religion or religious beliefs, but we became friends and respected each other. So I think that's the best way to respond to those who use clobber passages. Mark, do you have some, anything to add? Mary certainly has uh, dealt with this uh, more than I've ever needed to. My, my concern is, especially today in the United States, there is such polarization that it's hard to have that conversation that Mary suggests we have, even just to get to that point of uh, conversation. Um, there is a sense that we, we want to respond graciously and lovingly. There is a sense that I also have... Um, that I, it makes me wonder, well, what is driving this hatred and anger that people have 
um, I do not see that as of, of being of God. So there's something else that I understand going on in their life. Um, I would, you know, certainly, as I say, when I was pointing to the Acts 15 text there, it's my experience of LGBTQIA people that has really convinced me that, yes, this is how God is active and working. Uh, this is uh, to be inclusive in this way um, is very much what uh, God would have us do. Um, so I, I, I would hope we could have those conversations. Um, I, I'm skeptical and discouraged that they will happen, but um, my hope would be that we would be able to experience each other in gracious ways and that about, uh, eventually have those uh, conversations where we can talk about these things. Absolutely. It would, it would be, I think the world would be a much better place if we could all adopt Mary's approach to sitting down and discussing things rationally and getting to know each other. Um, I, I don't, I struggle with that, to be quite frank. Um, I think sometimes God put a sense of rage inside of me and, you know, he, um, not exactly sure yet after 67 years what he wants me to do with that, but I'm still trying to figure it out, you know. So, um, Rosemary, do we have any other questions? We do. Uh, we also have Judy Schaefer asking, some religions will kill homosexuals. How does a Christian stand against this? Should we, or is it live and let live? Well, I would think we would have to try to say, I mean, it's, uh, this becomes a similar sort of thing to, you know, uh, Jews and, and that in, in Nazi Germany, of course, it wasn't just the Jews, right. it was all sorts of people of gender issues that uh, the Nazis were um, imprisoning and killing as well. Um, so, I mean, there are times when you have to make a stand. I, I tend to be very pacifist myself and that's probably the biggest challenge I have is trying to know, okay, when do I work off my understanding of God as a God of peace? Um, and I try to create peace. And when, when is it that we actually need to step in and, uh, and do something that uh, may actually cause uh, harm to others? I, I think that's a real hard question, but it, it certainly seems that we're, we would want to stop that kind of behavior. Yeah, absolutely. Of, of harming others because of their gender identity and such. Mary, you have a comment there? Um, I was just going to say, you know, there's, it's true. Other, other faiths have um, put homosexuals to death. In other countries, they can put homosexuals to death, and they do it in the name of Christianity. So my response to some of that is, it's not something that, it's done by all of faiths. It's done by our own faith. Um, the, the, again, I just go back to the question I have is, it's not how I understand it. And I'll go back to this comment. Um, I have had people come up to me on the street and tell me I should, be, I should die. I should be killed. Um, not too long ago here in York, I had somebody who was openly carrying a weapon say he was going to shoot me. Um, and, you know, what, what do you say to that? Um, I couldn't have stopped him if he wanted to. Um, so I guess my comment is, if that comes to the point where that's where that person thinks God is calling them to be, then either, you know, it either happens or it doesn't happen. That's not on me. That's on that person who does that. Um, a country that puts people to death because of their sexuality or their gender identity also beheads people because of their faith. Um, you know, so it, it's a slope that I don't think we should go down. Um, again, using scripture passages, are we going to start putting women to death who have sex outside of marriage? That's in Leviticus. Um, so if you're going to do it for one, you have to, you know, let, let's not pull one passage out. Let's say, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to put, you know, those who are have sex outside of marriage to death. Um, it's, I, I think it's a strange argument. Yeah. 
Yeah, it would be. It'd be a very strange argument to have. And it's one to, to be quite frank in, in this day and age, I'd almost be afraid to voice it out loud um, for fear that someone would take it as their marching orders, you know, yeah. and go forward with that. Um, Mary, you've mentioned um, a bit about your time in the Sudan and that it was a predominantly Muslim country. And that raises a question for me that I've often wondered, how do other faiths look at the issue of sexuality and homosexuality or gender orientation? Um, what would be the, if you went back to the Sudan, uh, how would that be received if there's people there that knew you then and know you now? Um. I, I think you asked me two questions, and they're two different questions. Um, right. I can't speak to what other faiths do because I, I really am not an expert in that area. In Sudan, at the time we were living there, um, they would put to death homosexuals and those who were gender different. If they would have found out about me, they would have put me to death, which is one of the reasons why we left. left. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that there are Sudanese who I work with who know me and are accepting of me and love me and we're still in contact with each other and we're friends. There are Sudanese who don't know and would not understand. Saying that, there are people here who knew me before right. and are accepting and loving and people who knew me before and are not. My own family, my blood family has turned against me. I've not seen them in 11 years. Um, but then there are others who have held me up and, and, and loved me and kept stood around me and been strong for me. So I, I think, you know, again, it, it's, it's difficult to try and lump it all together and say, well, this is how it's done. Um, it's different. Now, were there homosexuals in Sudan? Yes. Were there gender variant people in Sudan? Yes. And interesting enough, in the indigenous religion, the, um, the before Christianity or Islam came in, the tribal faiths that were that were different, there were those who had what they called two spirits, and they were shamans, and they were lifted up, and they were held in honor. Yes. Um, did that mean that they were? Basically, homosexuals or are they transgender? I, I'm not that much aware of it. Um, but I think they were both. That changed a lot when Western people came and brought religion. It changed a lot when Islam came in and brought their form of religion in. Um, so it's difficult to say what one religion will do because, as I think Mark said earlier, within our own churches, there's different standings. Within every religion, there's different standings. Right. Um, within the Muslim faith, there are Muslims of who would be supportive, um, just like there'd be Muslims who would not be supportive. Right. Just like there are Christians who are supportive and Christians who are not supportive. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I think the issue of the um, the persons of two spirits is also a prevalent um, thought in. Um, Native American culture, um, you know, just from remembering from something that I read. But I think you raise a really good point there, Mary. You can't look at the the faith or the religion and say this is how they look at it, because take three people from any one faith, and you're going to have six different versions probably of how they look at it. Uh, there's the version that they have as a Muslim or as a Christian or whatever um, at the time that you ask them now, and then ask them a year or two later when they find that someone they dearly love has come out to them. Now, how do they feel about it? You know, and, has, has their opinion changed? Go ahead. And one, of the, one of the books that I love um, is, Written by Mark Actemar. I can I never get his last name right. Actemar. He was a professor at um, I think it was Union Theological Seminary um, in Virginia, Presbyterian, um, who was a Presbyterian evangelical and who was very much against 
same-sex marriage and the homosexual issue. And as he started doing more research about it, he wrote a book and it says, it's the Bible's yes to same-sex marriage. And it's a story about how he changed his opinion by reading scripture and opening himself up to what scripture was saying to him about the issue. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an awesome book to read um, because he has grace for those who don't follow him and, and change, but it says it's where he stands. Right, right. Oh, I came across a story today um, of a couple in, um, now I forget exactly where they are, somewhere in Southern um, US, Greg and Lynn McDonald, um, they are, are Baptist and they learned, they have adult children and they learned a few years back that their son um, was gay and they, they struggled with this. They were straight Baptists, very uh, strict in their following. Um, of the Baptist the theology, and it they feared for their child's soul. They really felt that he was doomed um, to a, a life of sin and 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 um, a um, afterlife of of no relationship at all with God. And they really didn't know how they were going to come to grips with this. And in the 20 some years that it, it says since they've had that revelation, they have learned not only to um, come to peace with their son's sexuality, but have learned that, that from their understanding of their religion, that God is calling them to embrace and love their son that no matter what any theology teaches, that the larger commandment is to love one another. And if you can't love your own child, how can you love God? And so they created this, this organization called Embracing the Journey, and they have helped thousands of families to walk that journey with their child and learn to um, to, to accept and to help and, and to really, um, you know, embrace the child and, and to welcome their partners into the family, just as they would a, uh, an opposite sex partner. So, which was, to me, was really um, very enlightening because I was kind of chasing down a rabbit hole. You know how you get on the internet and you start looking for things. I was chasing down a rabbit hole of, of uh, religions that were involved in conversion therapy and it was getting really scary. And I came across this and it was like, oh, this is a positive story. Um, have you had experience, either one of you, with um, individuals within one church or another that you've come across that have really helped other people or are there specific churches or denominations that seem to go out of their way to be open and affirming and helpful to people? I would simply point to the Reconciling in Christ movement. It's a uh, group of people. Um, it's an organization. You can uh, Google it and find their website. And uh, they have a very clear outline of, of what they understand to be the sort of inclusive and welcoming uh, sense of what it means to be reconciled in Christ. And uh, so uh, one way that you can identify organizations uh, like our, my United Lutheran Seminary and churches is um, have they uh, aligned and allied with reconciling in Christ? That would be at least one way I would point to. Okay. And, and for, the, for the Presbyterians, there's more like Presbyterians and there's a lot of others. Um, as far as the denomination, I know that pretty much is um, open and affirming straight through because it was created by a gay couple, and that would be the MCC church. Um, there are some who would say maybe that's not a Christian church, but they, I mean, they, they are there. Um, and again, I just want to go back and say, though, that you can't paint it by saying this denomination or that denomination. The right. Methodists, for example, have not come out as an affirming as a denomination per se, but they certainly have 
affirming congregations and I believe they're called reconciling congregations within within that denomination. Um, so yeah, you, you need to just kind of look and say where now, as far as do I know of any congregations that have really helped? Absolutely, absolutely. That's um, good to know. And, and there are some right in our vicinity, um, that, that in our area that are very supportive and very willing to, to be part of that. Um, the UCC Church Heidelberg, UCC downtown and York here, very open, very supportive. Um, my Presbyterian church, um, I don't wanna give its name right now because they're in the beginning passages of it, but not so much, but they've opened their doors to me and are loving me and they're supporting and strengthening. So it's a case where I see it as let's start the conversation, get to know me, and let's see where we go from there. Right. It is a journey, it's a path. It's a path. For a lot of for a lot of organizations, it is. So, and you have questions, I believe, Rosemary. We do. We have a question from Deb Smith who is asking specifically, how would you talk to a parishioner that believes God condemns LGBTQ plus members? And I would like to add, what advice do you have as a peer that could, I could speak to another member of our congregation that would believe the same? Maybe the, this comes back to again, where we've said is sort of the overarching uh, understanding that we have of God. and. And Lisa, you'd mentioned earlier the passage that it's probably easiest to point to is First uh, John four sixteen. That's the one that says, "God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, mm -hmm. and God abides in them." And so, one way I, I talk about this, even it, you know, is can a Muslim man love his Muslim wife? Well, yes, we'd say, of course. Well, if there's love there there's in some way God is present in that relationship there. So regardless of, of whatever kind of relationships where there is a loving, um, a loving relationship that is going on, um, that in some way is, is where we find God present. So to say, well, we're supposed to hate these people, to me that just seems so contrary to what is sort of my big understanding of uh, God. Right. Absolutely. I, and I always go back to Jesus' um, discussion about when he asks, what, what is the greatest commandment? Yeah. And, and the commandment he comes is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. And the second one is to, to love, love your neighbor, neighbor mm -hmm. as yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, again, I go back to Acts 10, um, and, and it's talking, you know, it says, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And, and it's, it's this whole process. So, I mean, my response to members of my congregation who tell me that I'm evil and I'm going to burn in hell and I should not be around is simply that that's not how I understand scripture. It's not my relationship to God. And one of the things that I question about church, when you talk church, is because way too many people, I think, look at their faith through, quote, quote, church. What does the church say? Mm -hmm. And I believe that our relationship to God is both corporate and personal. And, right. and my relationship with God is very personal. God held me in his arms. Can't get any more personal than that. And I just, I just know. So when they say that to me, I kind of feel sorry for them. And I just say, again, you will not be judging me. God judges me. Right. And, what, and what you're saying isn't my understanding. And when I see God face to face, I'm not afraid to stand before him for who I am. And when you see God face to face, you will know the truth. And, and you know, God will love you just as God loves me. I mean, it, 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 God is love. It's just, I can't get beyond that. Right. And that's really what it all boils down to. I, I, think, I think that's a good place to, to sum it all up. 
It really is. So, Mary and Mark, thank you both very much. We appreciate the discussion this evening. Um, got a couple of announcements to make before Rosemary signs us off here. Um, just to let you know that um, there is one more, th these are announcements on behalf of the Social and, and Racial Justice Committee at the YW. We have one more week for folks to go visit the Lexis Gore exhibit at the old post office. This is, Lexis Gore is a phenomenal artist, um, a woman of color, locally trained. She is a York College grad. And I can boast a little bit because I am too, um, although I didn't study art. So I, you know, she's got all the talent. I just have the certificate. Um, but um, her display is at the old post office, which is on Broadway in Hanover. You'll have, you'll have to go see it. It's a gorgeous display. Um, our teen upstanders, which is a phenomenal group of kids who uh, help to improve the local community, they will be cleaning the streets in Hanover on Sunday, November 21st. So uh, we ask that folks keep an eye out for them. And our next enlightening conversations will be Thursday, November 11th. And we'll be looking at the history and really the tragedy of the Carlisle Indian Boarding School. I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, but it's it's a, um, a really a nationwide embarrassment that happened right here in our backyard. Katie Thimer will be our speaker. She has had primary responsibility for researching and posting thousands of photographs about the Carlisle Indian School uh, through their Digital Resource Center website. And you can find um, a lot of those pictures at carlisleindianschoolresearch.com. But if you have a chance, tune in that night or find it on YouTube later and hear what she has to say about the history there of the, um, the Indian boarding school and what was done, unfortunately, to those children and what has been done to rectify the situation. So, Rosemary, thank you for your help this evening. Thank you, Mary, for your expertise yeah. and Mark as well. And um, good night, and we'll see you all on November 11th. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.